a big crowd. So uh, according to my script, we've been doing this four years now. So four years ago, uh, we, the Chester Carlson Center for Imaging Science, established our Imaging Hall of Fame here on the RIT campus. And then since then, we've inducted 25 individuals into the hall for their development of foundational theories of imaging, demonstration of key imaging technologies or systems, novel applications of imaging devices, or leadership in the indus imaging industry. Among the members of our hall are imaging pioneers such as Galileo, Marie Curie, Chester Carlson, and the recipients of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics, George Smith and William Boyle. Of course, we did it first. The Nobel Prize been just following our lead. And uh, today we're proud that we're going to be able to induct four more members to our Hall of Fame. So the way we do this is we have various people come up and uh, read the inductees, and then the master of ceremonies will uh, unveil the uh, recipient. Okay, so the citation for our first inductee in 2010 will be read by Ashley Miller. And Ashley is a first year BS student here from Henrietta, New York, who started studying imaging science during the summer between her junior and senior year of high school, when we here in the center offered a special section of our freshman class specifically for high school students. And she's currently enrolled in our new innovative freshman experience class, which there was an article, news article about today, so check, check the presses. So, uh, come on up. <laughs> Devices which could capture images at ultraviolet wavelengths 
led to his invention of an image converter for detecting electromagnetic radiation, especially in short wavelengths, in 1969. Dr. Carruthers went on to invent the first moon-based observatory, the Far Ultraviolet Camera Spectrograph, which was deployed on the lunar surface during the Apollo 16 mission in 1972. Carruthers designed and built several other space-borne imaging systems, including those that first detected molecular hydrogen in space, made the first UV image of a comet, and the first UV image of a meteor entering the Earth's atmosphere. A passionate, edu educator, passionate educator, Dr. Carruthers has been active in outreach programs seeking to bring science to youth around the country. He was named Black Engineer of the Year in 1987, awarded the Exceptional Achievement Scientific Award from NASA in 1972, and was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2003.
And then between 1929 and 1932, his TV system was used by the BBC for public transmissions of programming using commercially available Baird televisor receivers. He also contributed to the development of all electronic television later from the 1930s through World War II. He demonstrated the first fully electronic color TV system display in 1944, which was a 600 line system with triple interlacing. And he later proposed a thousand line system called Telechrome that would have produced images comparable to HDTV that we have today. John will be here. So that's our full set of inductees for this year and hopefully during, uh, after the keynote presentation, during the reception, you can wander around and you'll see on our walls all of the previous recipients here. So next we move to the keynote part of our presentation and our professor Jim Fuerta, who... Jin Wei. Oh, Jin Wei is going to... I told me that evidence, yeah. Jin Wei is going to uh, introduce our speaker. Hi, I'm, I'm Jin Wei. Uh, Jin Wei Guan, a uh, new faculty member in the center and in the Montreal Palo Science Lab. Uh, today I'm very glad to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Ramesh Raska who is currently an associate professor in MIT Media Lab. Um, as we know, computational photography is a new exciting research area that is highly interdisciplinary. And uh, today we are honored to have Ramesh as our speaker, who is one of the leaders in this area. He will show us the recent advance in this exciting uh, research area. So uh, Ramesh received his PhD from the University of North Carolina, uh, Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he joined the uh, media, MIT Media Lab from Mitsubishi Electric Research Laboratory in 2008 at the head of the lab's camera culture research group. His research interests include computational photography, inverse problems in imaging, and uh, human-computer interaction. His recent inventions, just to give a few examples, include transient imaging to look around the corner, next generation CAT scan machine, imperceptible markers for motion capture, long distance barcode, um, 3D interaction display, low cost eye care devices, and so on. In 2004, Ramesh received the TR100 award from Technology Review, which recognized top young innovators under the age of 35. Um, he also received, in 2009, he was awarded a Sloan Research Fellowship, and in 2010, he received the DAPAR Young Faculty Award. He holds 42 U.S. patents and has received four Mitsubishi Electric Invention Awards, and he's currently co-authoring a book on computational photography which I'm very looking forward to, as I want to use it as a textbook in my class. So without further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to present to you Professor Ramesh Raska. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Jack Tumbling, who's a co-author of my book, likes to say that 
you know, digital photography, or photography is, is like a lion that has been uncaged in a jungle um, after years uh, of, of being caged. And so <laughs> going and exploring the jungle, the lion just stays in one place. And I feel that digital photography is in that state today. It used to go and explore in some really wild directions. So let's go back and think about you know, the successful biological vision systems and see if we can learn something from that. You know, we have systems that are single chambered or compound eyes, and within that we have uh, creatures that use shadows, refraction, reflection, um, and human eyes are, are mammals, and uh, most of the cameras are using this very simple design, right? a lens uh, and a sensor uh, in a single chambered uh, um, <coughs> fashion. Is my audio correct? I feel like it's yes, sir. Okay. Um, but you know, there are there are creatures that actually use uh, reflection. You know, uh, a scallop actually has light that reflects off of this concave mirror, uh, and it's uh, imaged um, on the sensor. Or uh, a lobster has vertical sets of mirrors, and lights reflect off of that again down to a, a sensor. So think about that next time you are enjoying your seafood. <laughs> These creatures, in, in this case, uh, underwater creatures, use a very different mechanism. So why, you know, if you think about a computer, that doesn't make the human brain. Or if you think about uh, a aircraft, it doesn't mimic, uh, you know, the birds flapping. But somehow our cameras uh, continue to mimic uh, the human eye. And so we need to challenge that, and we need to see how we can go beyond that and possibly combine it with computation to achieve some great things. So if you talk about a wish list for photography today, and I just did this experiment, just asked all of my friends and colleagues, you know, what do you want uh, in, in camera in the future? You know, the lists are, are somewhat along these lines. By the way, it's, it's funny how you talk to you know people who really care about photography uh, in terms of as a consumer versus people who want to make money off of photography, their lists are very different. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so consumers want you know, superhuman vision, uh, very great resolution, you know, automatic trigger, you get camera that can look inside your body, uh, you know, zero start and shutter delay, you know, a, a good way to just keep the best picture somehow, right? Just get rid of the junk that I shot when I was you know, wrong decisions. And maybe you know, they can't find a lot of pictures, uh, but, the, but the one I guess get most often is to deal with that missing father syndrome. Right. You know, how come you know, you know, those family albums you don't have you know, pictures of the father? So <laughs> please bring that photographer back into the picture. Uh, hopefully one day we'll solve that. But companies care more about you know, cost, resolution, of course, but quite a bit about uh, you know mechanical free zoom and, and focus uh, and building recognition into it uh, and, and so on. But this is the this is a wish list based on you know. This is the wish list when you uncage the lion, right? When the lion has yet to start exploring the world out there. And so what I'm going to do uh, in the presentation today is really take you into directions that are a little bit crazy, a little bit spooky, uh, but you know, at least we'll know what else is going on in the jungle. Okay? So how about a camera that can look around corners? Or a camera that creates emotive renderings as if an artist had drawn them. Okay. And you know, just to give you this you know, uh, teasers, if you combine computation and photons, uh, if you combine, combine uh, bits and photons, we can do some amazing things. And computational photography is really a field where you want to think about not just processing of the bits through signal processing and computer vision and machine learning, or optics and display the sensor and play with photons, but creatively play at the intersection of these two fields. And that's what computational photography is about. It's, it's very broadly defined, uh, but hopefully it will give us uh, some, uh, some hint into what's coming uh, in the future. So I'm, just, I'm going to go down a few wish lists of my own. And by definition, uh, these are my wishes. And I may not have a solution for it. Maybe you have a solution for it. But we need to get it out there. So it will inspire the researchers and, and developers and, and uh, commercial entities to go and find that. So you know, I, I encourage you to come and talk to me uh, afterwards or, or during discussions, 
and let's let's get our wish list together. I think the holiday season is here, and let's be in the wish list mode. Yeah. So wish number one is I want ultimate post capture control. I don't want to take too many decisions at the time I take a picture and all those dials and knobs and so on. I should really just wave a camera and later on decide what I want to do with that moment. Right? So uh, a great example of that is actually by Mr. Lippmann. Uh, and Lippmann invented integral photography back in about 100 years ago, right? And over time, that concept has, has progressed and a, a great example is from Stanford, uh, from Ultra Voice Group, where they converted a camera into something called a planoptic camera by placing micro lenses on uh, top of an ordinary sensor. And from that, you start with a very large image, a 16 megapixel image, and you shrink it down to about a 300 by 300 megapixel image. But nevertheless, in that low resolution image, you can do some amazing things. You can digitally refocus the image after the photo was taken. Okay. So it eliminates that one key aspect, that one key decision you have to take when you're you know, shooting a photo. Right? And you can play with your depth of field uh, and so on. A really impressive work. I was highly inspired to, to uh, look into more into, into this space. And um, so we said, OK, let's, let's improve on that and see if we can convert any ordinary camera into a planoptic camera or a light field camera. And so we have a, a Mamiya digital format uh, 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 with a media format uh, pack. And we just take out the protective IR filter and uh, put this high frequency mask in there, um, put the filter back on. And by doing that, we're creating a very tiny space between the sensor and the mask. Because remember, there's additional protective glass on top of the sensor. And it turns out that this tiny gap, in this case about a millimeter uh, deep, uh, allows us to actually go and capture this plotting function. So <coughs> over the last 100 years, there was only one or maybe two ways of capturing inter integral images, either using a pinhole array or using a lens slit. And we basically now have a third solution to capture the integral image or plotting function using a very simple mask. And all the software code is online and it's been used in many different scenarios. We're taking this concept and building very different devices. We're building uh, HCI systems for interacting with screens, as I will show you. We're also building CAT scan machines and so on. And we're using the similar principles that Lipman had invented 100 years ago to do completely new forms of higher dimensional capture. Okay. So that was about focus blur. What about motion blur? Right? This is a picture that was taken uh, in front of my office when I was at Mitsubishi by my colleague uh, Amit Agrawal. And if you zoom in, you'll see the, the bus coming towards us, the car is going away. You can barely make out uh, uh, the, the information uh, about this car. So if you try to deep learn this in software, you'll not be able to recover much information if you try to apply some kind of a sharp and filter or all your favorite features that you'll see. So what we did was we built a camera called a flutter shutter camera, where instead of keeping the shutter open for the entire exposure duration, we flutter it open and closed in a carefully chosen binary sequence. So at the end, you still have one picture. And of course, if you try to do that mechanically, you'll probably void the warranty right away on your camera. So we actually used an LCD, uh, a photoelectrical CD, in fact, that becomes opaque and transparent within one exposure time. So you may have maybe 100 millisecond exposure time, and we'll open it about 50 times on and off. In a binary sequence. So in the end, you still get a photo that looks like this, and now you can uh, try to process uh, this image. Uh, can anyone make out the the car company here? Audi. Audi. And the license plate number? <laughs> you got an eight. You got an R. Four six eight. Any other numbers? What about the what about the alphabets? E. The F and the E, all right. <laughs> let's see. So let's keep blurring. Oh, it's a Volkswagen. Uh, <laughs> but you got the four and the eight and the five, I guess. But not the letters. So I guess R E is Volkswagen going really fast. <laughs> so you can achieve that now. You can, you can remove that decision at the time of capture. You know, should I, what, what F number should I choose? What exposure time should I choose? And you'll be able to take these decisions post capture. Because at the time of capture, the camera did something smart. It uses a sort of shutter or 
is chronometric capture. All right. Let's think about lighting. Uh, if you think about cameras, we have gone from this beautiful pieces of our beautiful, beautiful piece of artifacts, something that's really tiny and carry it uh, in your pocket. What about lighting? Have we gone anywhere from it? We still have to carry. You know, maybe that's the main difference between professionals and uh, consumers now. It's the lighting. You know, you're a carrier of umbrellas and spotlights and so on. So here's my wish. The same way we have been able to shrink a camera, I would like to shrink the light source, right? And I would like to use a camera where all I have is a flash or a multiple flash, I don't really care, but it should be in my compact device. And after I take a picture, I should be able to simulate all the effects I would have with this bulky, expensive, and circling light. And on top of that, I want post-capture control of which light was on and which light was off. Let's see where we go. All right, so that's wish number one. Ultimate post-capture control for focus, as well as for light. Okay, wish number two, freedom from form. I mean, we have, we have, we have as I said, made things portable and easy to use, but not really, you know, we still have to carry a lot of things. Uh, if you talk about photography, you know, there's always this notion of, you know, mine is bigger than yours, and I'm carrying all these lenses <laughs> and, and so on. And that means I take good photos. Right? And, and, you know, it's, it's funny, if you go on trips, and you know, I used to make this mistake, and you know, I'm with my girlfriend or my, my wife now, and I would say, oh, you know, you have to find somebody who can take your picture. And then you try to find somebody who has you know, a really fancy camera, hoping that this person knows how to take a picture better than everybody else. And I found an exact opposite. You give your camera to this guy, he puts you right in the center, you know, there's beautiful Eiffel Tower in the back, he's, he's covering the Eiffel Tower with my head, you know, and you give it to somebody who has, you know, a really poor skills in how to take pictures, and they do fine. So I think it's almost inversely proportional to your gear sometimes. You know, the last of the day all right, so uh, think about color. Right? Color is huge. I mean, you know, I talk to a lot of famous people here uh, in the color lab. And, uh, you know, there is 100 years of research in color lab. We still don't understand. It's pretty complicated. You know, I, I'm, I'm really glad that all the smart people who, who work with colors, I can call them up and they'll answer my questions uh, when I talk about color. You know, there's fixed gamut. You know, if you use a bare mosaic or even 360, it's a fixed mosaic. That's it. Just live with it. Why? Why can't I control color at the time of capture and post-capture? And don't tell me I can just change my opaque balance. That's just cheating, right? That's just changing the ratios of RGB. It's not true multispectral capture. So, you know, if I have, and if I try to, you know, make colors very saturated, then there's a trade-off between how much power and how much energy I can capture and how much saturation uh, I can achieve. So there's always this struggle uh, that's going on. But you know, as a consumer, I don't want to care about it. Just give me the color I want. So. Maybe I'm in a, uh, you know, outdoors in a green field, I want this gamut. And maybe I'm in a reddish scene, I want this gamut. And all I want is a camera where I take a picture and it's either programmable, I can have a dial, <coughs> or it's completely adaptive. I don't really care, I take a picture and it does that. I don't have to carry you know, a bag of color filters and put it on or use a different film which has a different spectrum to do that. I want to be able to control the color in a digital way, the same way I can control my exposure time, or my focus, or my viewpoint, and so on. So having complete control um, of, of color in a digital way is another wish. So uh, with my student and collaborator, Jack Tanglin and Amit Mohan, uh, we did something called an HR spectral camera. And the idea there is relatively straightforward, where you have your main lens, and then we use a diffraction grading that allows us to create a so-called <coughs> rainbow plane, a concept that hasn't been explored as much in computational imaging, but if you just put a piece of paper inside the camera with this modified design, you actually see a rainbow. And then it's up to you how to knock out each of the wavelengths or, or, or attenuate them in any way you want. So your final image, in the absence of this, um, this modulator, is an ordinary image. But by putting this modulator, you can control digitally any way the spectrum you want. Right? So I just want to dial in. My, my final image is still maybe three color but I'm able to dial in any way that I want. And if I have that, again, I, will, I think we will unleash a new visual art form where people really have complete control over the spectrum and its numbers. All right. 
uh, freedom from form. So think about uh, think about your um, uh, cameras in, in mobile devices. And yes, the reason we want them small is because they should be very flat. But what camera makers have been doing is in the effort to shrink in Z, they're also shrinking in X and Y. That's not what I want. I want a nice, large um, um, light sensing, light capture device, but the thickness should be flat. Right? I don't want a tiny camera that can, that's capturing very little amount of light. So there's something interesting happening, right? You have uh, companies like Sharp and Planar that are creating photosensing LCD. That means every pixel is emitting light, but it's also sensing light. You know, which means the LCD is actually a big sensor. It's a big image sensor. That's you know, four inches by whatever. So I should be able to use that as my camera, not just this guy back here. Right? And um, so if you can convert a big screen LCD into a camera and it collects a lot of light, you know, you can do it for video conferencing, you can do interactions with it, and so on. The problem is, of course, the, the reasons Sharp and others are putting this uh, into LCDs is for text sensing. You, know, you, can, you can play with it only when it's in contact. The moment you take your finger off the screen, you get actually a blurred image. So it's completely useless. And so they're really designed almost like flat pair scanners. You know, only when you're in contact, they work. So we said, why, why do we have to use these nice large sensors for that sense? Let's convert them into cameras. Uh, so for that, we used a method, as I said, uh, uh, inspired by Littmann's uh, integral photography, where we use a mask rather than a lens that right? So you have an LCD, and we just put this tiny of Mura cores, which are common in coded apertures, but very close uh, to the sensor. And with that, now we can convert a large flat base, sorry, large flat LCD into an array of a virtual array of hundreds of cameras. Uh, and from that, we can start doing some interesting operations. So this is a uh, light sensing LCD. And you can interact with this in 3D. Not just touch, but hover and interaction. And this is not like Kinect, where you stand far away and, and use it. It's a, it's a 3D gesture that's happening right in front of the LCD. And, uh, and what you'll see here is our debug, debug information. So every time you, this gives you the approximate depth of the nearest point, and when you touch, this becomes red. So imagine you know, going into uh, a store or your workplace, and there's an LCD, and you can just interact with that, you know, either by touching it or by gesturing it. Uh, and again, the idea here is to convert a single, <coughs> flag, a single uh, thin LCD into an array of 100 points of cameras, and then we're going to use synthetic aperture techniques refocus at different depths. You know, here the front, the left hand is in focus and the right hand is out of focus. But we can computationally refocus anywhere we want and by using the max contrast operator, we can create depth of uh, on everything. So the cameras of tomorrow will not be a camera that mimics the human eye like this, but the whole screen is a camera. I mean, when we went from the screen being not just display but also keyboard, it was already a, uh, you know, a huge revelation. But why stop there? Let's make the screen into a light sensing camera as well. All right, so that was freedom from form in terms of how small uh, size you can capture. Sometimes you have to go in the opposite direction. You know, what's the difference between a, uh, you know, a, a single point and shoot or cell phone camera versus a camera that has a lot of glass? You know, in this day and age, the main difference is the ability to create very shallow depth of field. Beyond that, there's not that much difference. You know, you can do lots of things uh, in, in, in software. Uh, you know, the flatness and, and vignetting, a lot of things you can be correct, correct relation, but the shallow depth of field, very important. People pay a lot of money for that. So imagine if you can, again, this is a guy who has a lot of, you know, lot of gear, right? And you know, standing in front of, you know, Apple Tower there. Seems, seems really odd, right? I should be able to just take a very tiny camera, and it should basically give me the depth of field that I care about. It's not easy, because you know, we know that it has a, a very small aperture, but we can use time, okay? 
Uh, and the idea is called image destabilization. You're all familiar with stabilization of images, stability motion between the sensor and the lens. And that's usually uh, used to compensate for uh, hand jitter. Right? Um, but let's see how we can exploit that intentionally. So even if you have a camera on your tripod, even if it's completely fixed, <coughs> but intentionally want to move the lens with respect to the sensor so that you will get shallow depth of field. So the idea is we're going to move the lens and the sensor in a relative speed with respect to each other. So the lens is moving slower than the sensor. And it turns out, if we, if you are if you're careful, and if you design it carefully, uh, this relative speed, then you can focus on any point you want. And you can create uh, a nice ratio of the depth of field that you care about, just by translating your camera lens and your camera sensor. And in a, in a typical camera, even a cell phone camera, there's plenty of space around the main lens that's unused. So all you have to do is shake it by a few micrometers and you'll be able to create over time. But it's still a single photo of very shallow depth of field. So we built that uh, in our lab. And here's a picture that's all in focus. It looks very boring. Uh, and then by doing this relative motion, right now it's just 1D for us. You know, you can focus in the front, or focus in the middle, or focus in the back, and depending, on the, depending on the speed that you have. And now you have an ability to uh, create very short and tough field effects using very small aperture cameras. Hopefully, that's another freedom from carrying um, large form factor devices. So, uh, after after uh, you know thinking about these notions of shrinking devices, I started thinking a little bit more about medical imaging devices. And if you think about how uh, uh, medical imaging works today, it's like photography 50, 60 years ago, right? If you were to take a photo at that time, there was a special place, there was a special guy. You go there, and the guy you know, puts his head under the hood, and it says freeze, right, for two seconds. Um, you know, he takes the photo and says, go home. After a few days, you'll get your data. That's your picture. And that's where we are today with medical imaging. Special place, special guy, freeze, go home, then you get your critical. And from that, we have come today in photography where you know if you if you spill coffee on your shirt, I'll take a picture. I don't care about that Kodak moment anymore. It's a Nokia moment or an iPhone moment. <laughs> and we want the same thing to happen for medical imaging as well. Right? We shouldn't be this a really important visit to some place to get your photo of your insights. It should be very casual. Uh, and you know, we already see some things going on, like being able to check your, uh, check your, check your uh, pulse uh, using you know, uh, applications on the phone. But we want to go well beyond that. So something we did very recently is uh, a device for measuring your refractive pattern. So Netra is a clip-on eyepiece that goes on top of your cell phone. You look through the eyepiece at the display, there are some patterns on the screen, and then you would use the keyboard of your cell phone uh, to align those patterns, and at the end, you hit calculate, and it would give you the data for your prescription for your eyeglasses. Your nearsightedness, your farsightedness, and astigmatism. Uh, and the reason why we can do that today is that the pixel pitch of cell phone, this was not possible even two years ago, by the way. The reason is the pixel pitch on your cell phone has improved dramatically in the last two years. We have gone from 100 dpi to 200 dpi to the retina image, which is 326 dpi. And at that dpi, the pixel pitch is 26 micrometers, you know, half the width of a human hair. And if you think about high-end scientific instruments like shock hartmann wavefront sensors uh, and barometers, they have a resolution of about 5 to 10 micrometers. So within a factor of three from these expensive equipments, and you know, for a dollar or two, you can create this clip-on eyepiece that interfaces with existing consumer devices. Right? So I think we have an opportunity to rethink and repurpose mass-scale technologies, mass-use technologies, and say, wow, it was done in a clunky way for years because there was no other option, mostly in laboratories and, and medical facilities. But now we can bring all of that and repurpose that. Just imagine 
more than four billion people in the world have a phone in their pocket in the world. And just within a few months or a few years, they will have you know everything cramped into their phones. You know, it's the camera, it's the GPS, it's the resolution of the screens, and these are extremely high-end innovations that are being cramped into this device. So even just if you, even if you just think about the display, as I said, at 26 micrometers, more than four billion people in the world are carrying a scientific instrument in their pocket. And it's up to us to figure out how to make the leap into something that's more meaningful than just watching your favorite episode of Lost <laughs> on Desperate Housewives. <laughs> oh, by the way, I made a mistake. Go and watch more episodes of Lost and Desperate Housewives because the more you watch HD content, the more cell phone makers will shrink their business <laughs> and the more it will help people in the remotest and poorest part of the world to use their phone as medical devices. So please go and watch that. <laughs> All right. So wish number three. I want my camera to understand the world the same way or even better than how I understand the world. Right? So, um, you know, you're all familiar with photo tourism or photo synth from Microsoft, Mr. Washington, just an amazing effort in taking pictures from Flickr, helpful of pictures of a, of a famous tourist location, and then uh, using structure for motion and other 3D reconstruction algorithms to create basically a 3D walkthrough of the pictures. The pictures you didn't even take, they're taken by somebody else, but you have virtual tourism. And beyond that, they have done some amazing work, right? If you go to the Trevi Fountain, Rome. Imagine on my screen, I can have this feature of a viewfinder. I take a picture <coughs> and it tells me in this scene what is the most interesting object. Right? It just marks it. Right? If you go to the Trevi Fountain, you know the fountain is important, the buildings are not so important. If you go to the Old Town Square in Prague, the fountain is not important, the buildings are important. Right? So a classical computer vision method cannot do that. But if my phone can trawl the Flickr and use photo tourism for the same kind of application uh, uh, platforms, it can tell me what's most interesting. And of course, how do they find what's most interesting? They just look at how many, how many people of all those thousands of photos, how many photos are you know, looking at the fountain versus the building. Right? It's just a voting scheme. It's just an amazing idea. And I want, I want a camera that has an understanding of the world. The same way if I take a tourist guide with me, they say, sir, please take a picture of this fountain because you know, that's what you're supposed to do when you're here. <laughs> right. So you want, you want this complete understanding. So what about the original problem? Uh, we want a camera that can look around the corners. You know, why should we constrain our photography and our imaging by you know, the physical limits of the biological and, and physical you know, limits of our vision? You know, we have computation, we have awareness. So I should be able to take a picture right now and be able to read the backs of all your chairs or what's happening, you know, outside that door. Can I do that? Sure. You know, if you have something interesting in the room, then the photons from this person or the furniture or the walls are actually reaching the camera. It's just that they're bouncing around and they're leaking through this door and reaching the camera. So the information is coming to the camera but the problem is the photons from the guy as well as the wall and so on are all entangled. And when they come out, you know, you wish you can interview each photon and find out what the story of this photon is. You know, hey, where did you come from? Who did you meet? Uh, you know, can you tell me did you come from here? You know, and so on. We can't do that. Right? And the problem is the photon is in a hurry. The photon doesn't want to answer the questions. The photon says, I must travel the speed of light. <laughs> so, you know, you have to literally run with the photon at the speed of light, <coughs> and maybe the photon will tell you the story. But you can today. So, again, we're going to use multiple monsters of light. We're going to use very fast uh, light source that's going to bounce light from the door and scatter uh, light inside. Uh, some part of that light will reflect back to the door, back to the camera. But a very tiny amount of it will actually come back to the camera. So, you're all familiar with echoes of sound. This is basically echoes of light. Right? But for that, we need some really high speed. Uh, so how do we do that? Um, we use something called femtophotography. Okay? So our flash 
is a femtosecond version, a quadrillionth of a second. And then we use a, a sensor that runs not a billion, not a billion, but a trillion frames per second. Um, and if you, if you do that, you're getting closer and closer to be able to catch up uh, with the photo. Uh, and where do you get this trillion frame per second cameras? Uh, actually, it turns out there was a Nobel Prize in 1999 in femtochemistry where they used strict cameras that do run at a trillion frames per second. Uh, and so when I started working on this project, uh, you know, be, just before I joined MIT, I wrote down all my ideas on how I'm going to use extremely high-speed cameras and detectors to be able to look on cohorts. And this field is called transient imaging. Um, and uh, you know, when I when I went around literally, I, I asked people all over the country uh, that I want to build this camera that can look around corners. I said, but why? You know, there's no there's no funding agency or there's no company that's coming and asking us to build a camera that can look around corners. And the other half of the people said, yeah, but you can use these high-speed cameras and and, and, and detectors, sorry, high-speed flashes and detectors, but people don't kind of shy the light in the room. They use it for biological or chemical processes to you know, look at it very carefully and you know, kind of really make those objects. objects. So but, you know, every once in a while you want to take these really high-end scientific instruments and then bring them out and just think about shooting them in free space for photography. You know, it's my wish. I want to be able to see our problems. So we have built that um, for the first camera, a little bit spooky, you can look at our corners. Uh, right now, our results are, are very simple, very low resolution. Nevertheless, we have them. Um, and if you have a camera that can look around corners, what can you do? You can help the bunny and, and, and tell the bunny if it's safe enough to walk in. Uh, help us still there uh, for the carrots. But you can do some more or less, uh, you know, you can do less uh, serious things than that. Like trying to save people uh, in a rescue and planning situation. Uh, by looking through visible parts of the building, maybe doors and windows, to see if there are survivors are moving around, or in robotics and car navigation, uh, you know, for car collision avoidance, or uh, medical imaging, which is one of the ways we are targeting, and endoscopes, where you can reflect light off of arteries or, or any uh, convenient surfaces and be able to look uh, around our doors. Okay. Let's see. Um, so as you, can, as you can see, I'm not showing you results here, but I, I'm happy to show you afterwards. So while we're trying to save the bunny, something else is going on. The barcodes are taking over the world. <laughs> they're everywhere, and they're just increasing in size. Why is that? Because a billion people are carrying a bunny, a new camera, every year. Now it's, I think, close to 3 billion. With that many people carrying cameras, there's even more incentive to start putting big barcodes or big QR codes, whatever you like to call them, so that we can interface uh, with information. That's stupid. These barcodes are machine to machine interaction. They're not for humans. They're taking you know, really important real estate in, in many of these cases. So we looked at this problem and we said, you know what? Let's design a new type of barcode. These are classical barcodes that you see, and that's going to be our barcode. It's as small as this, this dot here. And uh, how are we going to see it? If you see it with naked eye, it looks like a dot. Uh, but if you see that with a camera, you see something else. So when the camera is in focus, it looks like an ordinary dot. But if you just throw the camera out of focus, the pattern is the Again, we are not using zoom, we are just using focus because you can see the, the other barcodes are, are still there. And uh, the idea here is to exploit the fact that you can encode information not just in space, time, or wavelength, but also in angle. So if the radiance of the rays coming out of this dot is different in every different direction, think about holograms, think about the nuclear screens, if the radius is different in different direction, if you take a picture, if it's a sharp focus, you get a dot. But if you take a picture that's out of focus, you get a circle of confusion. But in our case, the circle of confusion is actually a circle of information. Because the radiance that was varying over different angles reveals the pattern that you care about. 
So suddenly we have a way to uh, create information in the world that doesn't destroy the aesthetics, but it still allows us to interact in a way that cameras help us uh, figure out what's going on. So you can do usual things like you know tagging objects or barcodes, but you know you can also interact with the world. Maybe when the Google truck goes by, all it sees is a small dot on the shop or restaurant, whatever you have. Um, but the autofocus camera on the Google truck can actually decode that pattern and it can upload that information. Right? And uh, if you think about a traditional barcode, it only restores you know maybe 100 bits of information. Uh, if you put a uh, put a put a if you put a camera pretty close to uh, this uh, this uh, uh, O code, then you can reveal you know, tens of thousands of bytes of information. So you can store you know a whole bus schedule or a whole uh, ringtone or a whole restaurant menu and so on uh, on this barcode. Right. So that's kind of vision number three that we want to create. We want to upgrade not just the cameras uh, by themselves. But we want to upgrade the rest of the world so that the photography and imaging of the future allows us to understand and react to the world around us. Okay? Vision number four. Okay, you recorded this picture to this photo. I want to share it with the world. Okay? So, um, you know, there are great efforts like LifeLog or the summary or, you know, different ways of preserving your privacy and information while you're sharing it, uh, and so on. But let's look at a simple problem. Whatever happened to the great slideshows? You know, you go on a trip, you take pictures, you scan it, you create slides, and then subject your neighbors and your family members to this slideshow. <laughs> Nevertheless, those are beautiful pictures, you know, the equivalent of 5, 10, 15 megapixel pictures. And what do we do today? We have these fancy cameras that are 5, 10, 15 megapixels. We come home and we watch them on this one or two megapixel screens. You know, we can't even see our pictures in full glory. So here's the problem. We have been going after wrong target. You know, when we talk about screens, we say, what's the resolution? Okay, two megapixels, HD, fine. But what's the frame rate? You know, because I want to play games, I want to watch movies. And we have been complete we have been complicating the issue by looking at the resolution in space as well as the resolution in time, which is the frame rate. So I said this is this is a bit odd, you know. Let's go back and rethink about this. You know, um, anybody heard about the slow food movement? You know, opposite of fast food. Um, you know, I want to sign up for the slow life movement. <laughs> and just, everything should just happen at, at my pace. But in the meantime, we said, okay, let's create a slow display movement. And a slow display would be, you know, it looks like a TV. It looks like a screen. But it gives you an experience like the old slide projectors. You know, the, screen, the image changes, you know, maybe every once in 10 seconds or maybe every minute. I don't really care. But the, the, the resolution of the image is good 15, 20 megapixels. Right? And the way we're going to achieve that is by using a, 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 a raster scan a, a projector, a laser projector. <coughs> but then the screen is going to be made up of a combination of photochromic and fluorescent materials. So that there's a persistence, right? It's like the the, the the demos in museums where you have a green screen and you jump in front of it, the flash goes off, and your shadow stays on screen. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a similar uh, similar idea, but where to go and do a full chemistry experiment and figure out all different types of photochromic and fluorescent materials. So we want literally materials from all over the world figured out you know, what they advertise is not really true, um, and, and, and came up with a combination of, of these materials. So go to store.org and sign up for this first edition of the slow life. Uh, All right. What about photo frames? Right? If, you, if you think about photo frames, you know, go on a trip, you know, maybe there's a beautiful flower, you take a picture, you bring it home. But the frame doesn't look anything like the flower. You know, if the flower is right next to it, you know, it does, first of all, it doesn't change the viewpoint. Okay, you can fix that, build the whole around, right? Thank you, Mr. Right? And, uh, you know, you can put a lenticular screen, so you know, it changes the viewpoint. But what about lighting? You know, as lighting changes in the room and the sunlight goes through, the real flower has caustics and shadows and reflections. The photo frame just doesn't have it. So imagine if you can create a photo frame that's not 3D, not 4D, but six dimensional, 
then it will respond not just to changes in viewpoint, but also changes in lighting. And so these are six geometric dimensions, 2D for X and Y, 2D for horizontal or vertical parallax, and 2D for position of the light. So creating this hyperreal photo frames uh, would be great. So here's an example of, let's say this works, uh, of a photo frame that will respond to light. It's all the caustics and shadows, uh, uh, and reflections, and so on, uh, will respond. But of course, to create a 60 photo frame, you also need a 60 camera that will take a picture of your object, not in 3D and 4D, but also under all lighting conditions. And it goes back to my first, one of the first wishes of a compact light source. Okay? And beyond creating hyper-realistic photo frames, I should be able to print any material I want. If I take a picture of something, I should just come home and not get this 2D printout from a fancy printer, but I should be able to just print that material. You know, it should look like that. It doesn't have to behave. It doesn't have to have mechanical or kinematic or dynamic properties, but in terms of appearance at least, I should be able to print it. And there has been some uh, great work at SIGGRAPH by different groups that has made some progress in this direction. So it's looking very promising, but to share the visual experience, I should be able to create optimistic frames and be able to print the material that I capture. Okay, wish number five, uh, capturing <coughs> the distance. And this was a little bit controversial, right? Because if you think about it, when you try to build a camera with the fancy camera makers, build the lenses and sensors, they're mostly cared about if they can capture the signal, the photons, with the best signal to noise ratio without any distortion, geometric or photometric distortion. But if you think about the human eye, it's a pretty poor camera, actually. Right? There are all kinds of distortions, and over time it just gets, gets, keeps getting worse, which is good, because then people around you start looking more and more beautiful. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't see them very well. It's very important, because we, you know, we, look, look, we look for the inner beauty, right? Just um, and what you care about is the essence. Like if I go and have a great meal, or if I'm on a roller coaster ride, I cannot take a picture of that. You know, I cannot capture the essence of the moment. And if you think about uh, visual art forms, right? That's what it is, right? It's not a photo. This is a great work by Gene Yu and then Macmillan. You know, it's a picture of the whole face. And if I have an object and I've seen it, you know, I don't kind of take pictures of it uh, blinking my eye. You know, I, I have a good sensation of what the overall 3D structure of this whole object is. I don't remember a face as how you look from the front and how you look from the side, but you know, I have a general sense of, of how you look. So, you know, just the way a camera, you know, a few hundred years ago, made photorealistic paintings obsolete. Right? That's not a big deal. I think we're reaching a point where cameras are getting pretty boring. They just capture the photons as they are. They don't capture the visual sense. So I'm really looking for the next visual art form or next next platform. It could be hardware, software, intelligence. I don't know what it is. But I would like that to make today's cameras obsolete. Because I don't want to see the same things again and again like a photorealistic painter would have done. Okay, so here's uh, one example. <coughs> if I want to see what's inside, uh, you know, if I open the door and see what's inside the car, I can just grab a camera and take a picture. But companies, you know, by instruction manuals and so on, they go and hire artists. Why? Why do we hire artists when we can photograph it? And why do artists do such a great job? You know, too many problems with the photo. Right? It has shadows, unnecessary clutter, uh, too many colors, actually. And artists are really great at focusing on what's the essence of this uh, visual representation. Moving parts, very simple colors. So here's the problem. I don't want to replace an artist, but I would like to create a camera that gives me a photo that looks like this, not like this. Take a picture, it gives me something like that. So we tried something along those lines. And as I said, it doesn't go all the way. And the idea is to use a multi-flash camera. Uh, we're going to take a picture with a flash. Uh, and all the flashes are to the left, by the way, because most people are right-handed. Um, you see a sliver of shadow at each discontinuity, you know, at each point. And that's somewhat annoying, so use ring lights and so on. But let's let's use those shadows, though those are our friends. 
What if we intentionally put a flash on the opposite side? Now all those shadows will be to the left of all the contours, right? And same if you put top and bottom. I'm going to get this series of shadows, this slivers of shadows, and we're going to exploit those shadows to create and find places where there are important contours. Um, and so, you know, this is original photo. If you just want to use an uh, edge detector, you know, if you have a photo editor, something that looks like this. It's about meaningless. Those edges are very meaningless. But in our case, we get nice, beautiful contours. And if you put that together, you're going to get a picture that looks more cartoon, more comprehensible, uh, and so on. And actually, Jim Farberta was the one who taught me about functional realism versus photorealism uh, and physical realism. And this is functional realism, right? Um, and here is another example. Uh, the, I think the projector is blowing out the, the nice contours. But again, I want to be able to create this line drawing. This is nowhere close to you know, what a beautiful artist, uh, what an artist would draw, but this gets closer. And at least the cumbersome task of scoping and so on will be eliminated, and then you can really focus on the creative and artistic aspects of modifying uh, this picture. OK? So OK, we talked about uh, lots of crazy ideas on, on optics and illumination and sensors and motion. But if you step back and say, you know, what does a consumer really care about? Right? Maybe the consumer doesn't really care about you know, how fancy is the sensor, how fancy is the flash. All they want is a big black box with one big red button. There's no flash, there's no sensor, there's nothing. I don't really care what's there. And the moment you take a picture, let's say you are in Times Square and you take a picture, which is a big black box and a red button. Remember, there's no lens. What you do is you go on Flickr right, instantaneously and you draw Flickr and say, hey, show me all the pictures of Times Square <coughs> which are taken roughly this time of the day, roughly from this point of view, and bring it back and show it to me on the viewfinder. Right? So you didn't really capture the photons from Times Square but you capture the photos that were already in the cloud. And that's probably good enough, because you know, I'm going to take a picture, and I'm going to walk a few steps, and go to the, uh, go to the, uh, the, the souvenir shop, and go to buy another photo of Times Square anyway, because there's some guy who had a lot of patience, who waited there for a long time, just for the right day, with you know, beautiful weather, uh, and, and grabbed a picture. So you know, you're doing that anyway, so why not just bring that functionality? directly your devices. This was a nice art project um, by Sasha um, of, um, on creating a blind tab. So despite everything we're talking about, you know, all the things I've talked about, sometimes I step back and say, you know, maybe, maybe that's not what we want. We, all we want is to just take really good professional photographers, which is already there on record, and create an interface with this electronic device and, and, uh, and, and what people really want. Maybe you know my career as a computational imager, computational photography. You know, it, it, you know, sometimes you know, once in a while, you know, I, I, I challenge myself. It's, it's challenging. Is that what people want? Uh, fortunately, there are other things like you know, you want to take pictures of your loved ones. Oh, I'm glad people have loved ones because then you know, <laughs> the professional photographer may have may, may not have taken a picture of your loved ones. But you know, there's a problem there because in your online photo album. There's probably a better picture of my wife. Uh, you know, maybe she's in a better mood, and my daughter, and you know, maybe she's smiling. And it's much better to take that picture from my album than what they're doing right now, because my daughter, who's 15 months old, is almost never looking at the camera. So I would rather just take a picture from my album when she's looking roughly in my direction under roughly the right lighting, and just you know, copy and replace in my picture. So even there, it's not clear if I should carry a camera that I take. You know, captures photos. But that's a whole different discussion we'll have uh, uh, over over things. So, wish number six. It's really your wish, and I want to hear from you. And uh, over the reception, I would love to hear from you. Or send me an email, uh, or post it on my Facebook wall. Uh, how to do it? So, um, uh, you know, I gave you this <laughs> wish list, and many of them I don't know myself what the answers are. But you know, every once in a while, I have to respond to my sponsors and. and Ramesh, you better tell us what's happening in the next three years. So I'll just stick my neck out and say, all right, this is my top five for what we will see in camera. So this is this is what it is. Okay. I'm really sticking my neck out of this one. So first is HDR. I think 
think that's obvious. It's already some cameras. The next is light field. Again, thank you, Mr. Lipman. Right? Um, multispectral. Thank you, Mr. Holt. Uh, uh, <coughs> right? Color photography. So I think this is already coming. I think you're going to see in the next two years have ability to capture integral images, 4D light fields, and be able to refocus digitally and be able to completely get rid of any kind of aberrations post capture. So you don't need to fancy optics if you can do everything uh, post capture. But the spectral, where it will not be just a better spectrum, but it will be completely programmable, and the future it will be dark. Um, frameless capture. You know, we don't look at the world like this. <laughs> no, it's, we don't have a notion of a frame. You know, there's photo, video, the start time and end time for every pixel is all very fluid, right? Not all the pixels, not all the cones have the same, same start and end time. They do it based on what they're looking at. So a frameless capture, uh, I hope, will come around and that will give us complete functionality and deal with all kinds of issues we deal with just because we have this very discrete representation in time and space uh, of our world. And number five is a really interesting light source, a programmable flash you know, that can project patterns, you know, highlight certain things, have a different color gamut for lighting, you structure light for getting 3D information, even time of flight ranging. I mean, the Xbox Kinect is a good example where the camera is actually not that smart, but the light source, the refraction grading on the on the photodiode is what creates that invisible infrared um, array of dots that allows the camera to estimate 3D information. Uh, <coughs> and that's not time of flight, it's using unstructured light. Nevertheless, I think programmable light sources are going to play uh, a really big role. Right. So you know, with uh, with due credit to Doc Edgerton um, and also uh, people online who are capturing photos with their cell phone cameras of this, this is a real photo by the way taken by cell phone camera of a rotating blade which has uh, an interesting uh, temporal relationship with a rolling shutter. So you see this very interesting artifact, right? But these are photos kind of what you see or what you capture is what you get. But photos of the future will not be along those lines. They will come from not a kind of single point in the world mapping to a single pixel or a single time instant, but they will be completely created on devices and platforms, online, offline, with the true fusion of photon, photon true fusion of optical processing as well as digital processing. So all I can say is that photos of tomorrow will not be recorded, they will be computed. Thank you. Image this 
the destabilization process. Is that working like a uh, tail and shift lens? Uh, repeat the last part, T-O-N? Uh, no, tail, tilt and shift. Uh, tilt and shift. So actually, you don't have to use tilt and shift in this particular case, but that's an excellent, excellent point that you could actually also exploit tilt and shift to create other types of shadow depth of field. Uh, that's very true. If you're familiar with um, uh, TDI, um, TDI imaging, time displacement imaging, time delay imaging, it's, it's more similar to that. You have a question? So I have a question. Can you explain more about the camera that can look around the corner? Oh, yeah, very spooky. <laughs> So, so that's it. it's echoes of light. I mean, it, let's say you uh, you uh, keep the door closed. Okay, my echoes of sound will be different than when you open the door, right? And at the same time, you know, you know, it, it happens to us all the time. But right? you you can hear people well before you see them with, with naked eyes. Same thing with light. The photons from that person beyond the line of sight are actually reaching you. It's just that your own eyes are extremely slow in terms of processing those photons. So, you know, we don't see the person till the in the direct line of sight and we have been taught that camera should behave and mimic human eye. But again, if you add computation to it and make them fast enough, then you can start doing things that are seemingly impossible. But from a computational point of view, they're not that different. They're not that different. I mean if you had told somebody, you know, a few hundred I'm sorry, uh, a few decades ago that you can see inside the body, <coughs> you know, that would have seemed uh, you know, sacrilegious, I don't know. Uh, for cats can do that for us. And what we're doing is a, a, a similar mechanism, you know, trying to make the invisible visible uh, by processing all the, you know, processing every photon by every photon uh, and exploring information in the physical world, not just in the software world. Is it some combination of the properties of the flash and the reflections that allow you to determine the image around the corner? You're going to be getting photons from the natural scene. Absolutely. So it's, it's okay. active, active imaging, right? So it's just like echoes of sound. Unless I, I speak, I will not hear my own echoes. Okay. So similarly, uh, echoes of light, you, you flash a very short duration laser pulse, or oh. a second duration laser pulse, um, you know, one part trillionth of a second. Um, and that's going to bounce around in the room and come back to you right. and by analyzing those echoes. And be very distinct from the you know, ambient light. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And and uh, you know, technically speaking, we are looking at the the impulse response of the room. So you know, if I if I if I hit this table, that's an impulse response, and the way the table vibrates tells me something about the table that I cannot figure out just by looking at the table. And similarly, for transient imaging, we are shocking the room by sending this pulse and see how the room will respond back to that tiny, uh, very short pulse of light. And from that, we have an impulse response. Again, if you use a terminology from control theory, mm. impulse response tells you much more about your your your, your feedback control system than a steady state response. Just one last quick follow up. How carefully do you have to model the environment to capture the reflections current? Do you have to model the properties of the door? Or no, do we don't know anything. We have never been anything? inside that room. Uh, and you know, as you know very well, uh, that a, a traditional time of flight camera can directly give you the distances to every um, visible point. The direct line of sight. So we can get that efficiency, that's not the problem. So the visible part of the world, you know, it's a it's you know, a year old technology. Yeah. But what's interesting is that after we have modeled what's in the line of sight, we can also model what's beyond the line of sight. And there are lots of limitations. You know, if if things are are behaving like mirror, then we may not get light back. If things are completely dark, you know, we may not get enough reflectance uh, back from them. If the room and if, if what's beyond the line of sight is floating confetti. Right? It's too difficult to analyze the reflections from different parts of that config. So we have to make some assumptions about the world is mostly mostly free space and there are a few opaque objects and so on. So if you make you know a very simple scene, if you use uh, if you exploit very simple scene priors, then you can actually recover um, a reasonable amount of information about it, even with today's technology. Do you have some pictures you can show? Yes, please come around here. Thank you. Okay, so maybe that's a good point to uh, thank our speakers. We'll come crowd around here for a little bit and then move out to the uh, reception. And then, uh, if you definitely want to make a announcement about the. Uh, oh.